Good morning. Um, so I'm Mike Acton from Insomniac Games. I'm the engine director there. I've been at Insomniac for um, a little bit more than 10 years as the engine director um, and um, have been working in basically the AAA game space, console space for something like 22 years. Um, it's the space that I know personally and that I most enjoy working in. Um, so the teams that I work with most closely uh, are engine teams. That's, that's my, my personal team at Insomniac. Um, and so I'd like to talk about my experience in working with and leading engine teams in our space. Um, and the things that when I talk to new engine programmers or people out of school or even uh, experienced programmers that are coming from other backgrounds and other studios, the things that I find that they're most, that I have the most trouble with when, when we need to integrate them into our team and our process, and the things that I think are critically important to the work. Um, so I'd like to talk about those things that I feel are missing most commonly. And it might not be what you expect. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, I think the, the reality is there's a, there's a huge demand for good engine programmers. Um, even in a world where we are using, um, where most studios are using someone else's engine. Most studios are using, say, Unity or, or Epic's engine um, or some other engine. There's still a huge demand for engine programmers. Somebody has to fix those things when they're broken. Um, especially locally on the ground. You can't wait until some other studio can fix the problems that you have when you're trying to ship a game. You need someone qualified on the ground to fix the issues at hand that are in context to the games that you're trying to make. So really every studio has a need for someone who's expert at this level, um, even if you're using somebody else's engine. Although I would argue, for the most part, it probably is um, a good idea to you know, build your own tech, something that serves your purpose better than something that's general purpose and context free. Um, but again, for a little bit of context, when I look at a new associate programmer, a new associate engine programmer on my team, um, I think I tend to uh, look at sort of the, uh, their ROI overall, like how long until they have a net positive value for our team. That doesn't mean how long does it take for them to do something useful, that's almost immediate. Like they can join the team and do contribute something useful almost immediately. However, um, given the amount of training that's required and the amount of time that must be spent with any new programmer, um, and the amount of um, work to bring them up to speed culturally and technologically and training and all that, you know, that, that takes time from other people. That's a positive thing, that's what we want to do, but it does in fact take time. So, in my experience, it takes about two years to get to the point where we're a net positive overall um, for, a new pro for a new associate programmer. Um, so uh, what I found is just sort of looking at the history of, of what, people are, what advice people are giving to, to new programmers, I found there's lots and lots of really, really bad advice out there. Um, and I'd like to not add to that today, but we'll see. Um, so if we go into same, like, uh, some samples from things on, on Quora, um, sort of a question that you'd expect people to ask, what are the five most important programming concepts? Let's get, you know, um, some of the things that people responded with. Um, one of the examples was, well, everything should have a single responsibility and that's just a core programming concept and you should just do that. Um, the reality is that this is not true. Um, we have lots and lots of things in reality, practically speaking, from an engineering point of view, that have more than one responsibility because they must, because it is more efficient, because it makes more sense, because that combination of things is in fact the most likely scenario. Um, a multiply add is a, is a straightforward example that everybody can understand. Like statistically, you're, you know, you're gonna multiply and add together. Those two things together um, are super common, common enough that those things should be welded and present their own solution. Um, the, the fact that they could, you could do multiply and add separately has no value. Like that's not, it that has no intrinsic value to do that separately. The, the value here is to take the most common problem. What is the most statistically common thing that you're going to do? And that's the thing you're solving for. Not the statistically unlikely scenario. Um, don't reinvent the wheel is another common piece of advice you might hear. Um, this again is total nonsense. Um, what we do often is reinvent the wheel in order to 
learn how the wheel works um, and make our own adjustments to it. Um, and the, the reality is the world is not one size fits all. Like whatever it is, whatever the thing, the piece of technology that you're, you're evaluating is, it was built under certain conditions, for a certain context, for a certain group of people, um, for a certain type of game, whatever. That not, doesn't necessarily fit your situation. Um, and so you may have to create something that works better for you. Um, so learn, spend a lot of time reading, more, you know, more time practicing reading than, than writing code. Um, I think this is generally good advice. Like you're gonna spend a lot of your, your, your practice and a lot of your career reading code. So it's generally good advice. Um, but it's misleading uh, because I think what the, the, what the advice is giving is you should be able to read code as though it is something like um, a book that you can just read through and make sense of. Um, but that's not the skill. The skill is not you know, my ability to read C++ or my ability to read Python or my ability to read in this language. That's not the skill. The skill is looking at that and inferring from that what the concepts are, what the constraints are, what, how, why it was built the way it was built. That's the skill you need to practice, not the reading part. Uh, another piece of advice that's common is, you know, um, you don't have to recode anything if you plan and design first, right? Get those requirements out, design it first, and you won't have to recode anything. All right, this is, uh, let's, calling this nonsense is sort of generous. Um, you're never going to have all those requirements up front. Like, that's not a thing, you know, that's not a thing in the real world at all. You learn, we learn as we go. Um, and you're working with the team, and they're discovering things, and you have to make those adjustments. Um, you know, you, you use the best knowledge you have, and you make the, decision, the best decisions you can with the knowledge you have. You don't ignore those things, but you can't assume that nothing new will come, you know, come about either. Uh, write in such a way that the next programmer picking up your project can actually read and understand your code. Um, so again, this is generally good advice. Like, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, inherently, but it is misleading. Um, because how this is this is how this is this advice is usually wielded is to assume that the next programmer in line, the next person that's going to be reading your code, is an idiot. Um, so you should write it in such a way that an idiot could read it, um, and that's not true, right? The people that you're generally going to be working with, the people on your team, um, you need to be. You assume that they're smart, right? Assume that they they be generous with your assumptions on the, who that programmer is going to be, and assume you know it's you in the future. What you want to do is give them a hint, right? Assume that they're smart. Make sure that they can get to the place that you got in order to write that piece of code. Give them context. Give them information. Give them a model to work with and how to build that model in their head. But don't assume that they're an idiot. Um, abstraction. Um, so everything, you know, I, I won't go into this, but everything is um, about how we can abstract things more. And really, um, um, you know, what we are doing is we're engineering in reality. Right? We have real problems, real hardware, real data. We need to work in the reality that we're dealing with. Um, I am not engineering in an imaginary fa fairy tale land. Right? Um, I'm not engineering for an abstract model that's we're running on an abstract piece of, you know, an abstract computer, just telling an abstract story. I am specifically building a game that needs to run on this specific, you know, finite set of hardware, and it needs to be done in this specific amount of time, in this specific amount of money. Right? Um, there's a reality that we need to actually build for. Um, so this wall of text basically implies, as advice, that memory is not important, right? It's an abstraction. You don't need to worry about it. It's not a, it's not a thing you need to <laughs> concern yourself with. Just write your code. I don't, <laughs> this kind of advice just makes me sad. Um, it's largely the most significant thing that you're going to be dealing with, right? Um, in terms of first order approximations of what is going to be the bottleneck in your system, it's going to be memory. <coughs> Any kind of shared resource at all, memory being the most common one, is going to be a huge bottleneck to your system, whether that's shared resources memory, or it's optical media, or it's hard drive, or it's whatever. Any shared resources is going to be something you have to reason about and you have to design around. Um, the network, whatever. Um, you can't just abstract away the actual engineering problem that actually exists. Um, so three specific things that come up commonly. Are, um, one, the compile is your friend. Um, premature optimization is the root of all evil and big O notation. Um, so again, there's nothing really wrong with these things except that they're super misleading. 
Um, so the compiler is a tool, it's not your friend. Right? It's just a tool written by other programmers and it's certainly not magic. Um, your responsibility as a programmer is the thing that it spits out. You're using the tool to generate the thing. You're not responsible for the code that you're writing and the, te the textual code. Nobody gets that, nobody cares. You're responsible for the thing that you're, you're the, using the tool to generate, right? That final executable, that tool that actually transforms the data, the thing that runs on, you know, at runtime, that's the thing you're responsible for. You happen to be using a tool to do that. So you can't blame the tool for the problem and you can't expect it to do magic. You are using the tool, you need to be an expert in that tool. Um, premature optimization is the root of all evil, super common. Hammer is like, we don't need to worry about that right now, we'll worry about it when it's a problem. Unfortunately, um, by the time it's a problem, it's way too late to fix the vast majority of times. Um, and so what I want people to not confuse things with is you don't confuse sort of pre the concept of premature optimization, which is in itself a valid concept, right? There's some things that you, you know it's optimizable, right? You have reasoned about it, you say, I, I know how to do this, I'm just choosing to not to do it right now. That's fine. Um, with getting the clowns out of the car, which is, this is just ridiculous. This has, serves no purpose, this just gets in my way, this just makes everything slower. Why would you have that in there at all? Get that stuff out as soon as possible. Uh, big O notation. Um, big O notation is, in and of itself, a sort of a reasonable tool. However, again, very misleading in terms of actual real world performance. Um, C, the constant in big O notation, is extremely large and variable in our real world con context. Um, and it doesn't say anything very, very much in terms of concurrency, and in sort of concurrency is something we deal with constantly. So we need to rethink sort of how we model as, you know, how we internally model um, performance estimates. And this sort of thing that we're taught in terms of analyzing a sequential operation of things without consideration of the actual cost of that that C of that constant um, is not a good model for, for actual performance costs. Um, so as a, you know, as a team, as an engine director, what can I be expecting? Um, there's lots of individual sort of skills that I would like to see. Um, technical skills like understanding how the OS works, how, understanding how CPU works, the GPU works, understanding how memory buses work, having experience with SIMD, being able to read and write assembly fluently, um, and researching some area of expertise. You have some domain expertise and that you are actively researching it. All these things are sort of basic expectations that, that I think somebody should have. This is not what I'm talking about today. Um, I think the real problem I see with engine programmers is something much deeper than these individual technical skills. Um, and that I find that a lot of people are essentially incompetent in three fundamental areas. Uh, one is practice, two is having a reasonable defaults, and three is problem solving. Um, so, quick, quick crash course. Um, none of these are very hard. Let's talk about practice. Um, so, why do you practice? Um, what is it? I mean, you should be practicing at you know, your profession essentially every day. This is your career, this is the thing that you should be practicing. How do you practice? Um, you want to use your practice to explore your gaps in knowledge. You want to aggressively try to find things that you don't know and fix that. That's the point of practice. Get better at what you're doing. Um, practice is ephemeral. The purpose of practice is to practice and get better. You're not building a project. You practice and you throw away the thing that you did. You're not trying to build a project. You are trying to practice. Treat it separately. Um, it's not competitive. Um, so if you, know, you don't want to practice against somebody else, demo, demo teams and demo you know, groups are cool, but they are not practice, they are something else. They're building a project, they're working with another team, that's a different kind of thing. It's not a research project, a research project is a different thing, it has its own goals. It's not, again, not a project in and of itself, you're not trying to build anything, you are trying to practice. Um, it's something you do daily, um, and you can fit it into 30 minutes. You just plan what you're doing in that 30 minutes. I am practicing this one thing, I want to see if I can get better at this one thing and then I'm gonna throw it away. You know, whether or not it's, like I want to get better with this API, fine. Um, you know, I, I wanna be able to write this application in 30 minutes. Okay, the first day I get nothing. Like I can barely put, string together main and open hello world in 30 minutes, fine. The next day you can throw that away, next day you start over, I've remembered how to do that, I can do a little bit more the next day, fine, throw that away. Next day I can do a little bit more, a little bit faster. Throw that away, next day a little bit more, a little bit faster. By the time you've done it, whatever it is you're trying to learn for 20, 30 days, you're gonna be much faster and you can do a lot in 30 minutes. But you have to diligently practice and you do it every day. So, second thing, having reasonable defaults. 
everybody, every programmer needs that sort of tool bag of things. Um, rules of thumb, these are things I reach to when I see a common problem. Um, what is the first thing I'm going to tend to reach to? Uh, so, shortcuts to that sort of first pass solution. One is almost, almost always a linear search through the array is the answer. Like, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Um, so you start with that. The first thing, if I need to find something, I'm gonna do a linear search through the array, and only when that doesn't work, only when that's really slow, am I going to consider something more complicated than that. Um, in the reality that we live in, the vast majority of the time, when we're talking about the scope and scale of things that we're dealing with, most times, most things, that's sufficient, and probably, actually, the fastest thing you could be doing. Um, in terms of concurrency, a FIFO managed by an incrementing integer is pretty much the fundamental data structure that you'd be dealing with. That's it. 90% of the time, if you're dealing with concurrent things, having a FIFO managed by an incrementing integer is all you need. You don't need anything more complicated than that. Um, store things by type. Don't store the type in things. So organize them and sort them by their type. So the type is implicit. Um, have multiple things by default. Again, this speaks to um, what's, the, what's the statistically most common case and solve for that first. So when you're talking about, you know, I have a bunch of, I have 10,000 objects in the game. Well, the statistically most common case you have is I'm updating a lot of objects all at the same time. It's not, it's extremely uncommon that I'd be doing one thing. However, by default, programmers reach to the, I'm gonna update this one thing, object update, object render, whatever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna update this one individual thing. That's statistically unlikely scenario that you're doing just one thing. So don't do that. Don't reach to that default first. Reach to the multiple case first. The single case is degenerate and almost insignificant the vast majority of the time. Uh, explicit, have explicitly la explicit latency and throughput constraints, which means when you're designing a system, say, what is my latency constraint and what is my throughput constraint? You know, how long should this take to complete and when should I be able to issue another command? Those should be explicit. You should write those down as part of your system design. You know, can I, can I issue another command in 10 milliseconds, 10 microseconds, whatever? When is this going to be done? Is it going to be done a zero latency thing, it's essentially sequential, it's gonna be immediately return, or is it gonna be done in 16 milliseconds or 32 milliseconds or whatever? When can I guarantee this will be done? Have those explicit constraints. Um, randomly, um, I think it's sort of slightly different from the rest of these, is version your serialized data. This is something that people just doing on the fly forget to do. Oh, if you're gonna save it, save it with the version. Full stop, every time. Um, even for throwaway things that you're doing in scripts, always have a version because you're always gonna break it if you don't do that. Um, have simple allocators that you reach to for the vast majority of time. This is all you're ever going to need is these three types of allocators, which is a block allocator, a stack allocator, and a scratch allocator. Um, the vast majority of time, that's all you need. Um, model uh, your target manually first. So if you, ha if you want to create something, I want to create, say, an AI, or I want to create some kind of rendering system, whatever, find, do every, cheat in every possible way you can to model how it's supposed to work first. Don't build the system to do it first. Cheat. So if you need to create an animation to move the AI in such a way that you can sort of see how it's going to work, or you need to sit in Photoshop and try to paint over the image so that you can see how the render is going to work, do that. Get, somehow visualize what your target is for everything that you do as quickly as possible because that's what's gonna tell you whether or not something is broken as quickly as possible. Um, and in terms of a super common data structure that you just need to understand and you can reach to is some kind of index look aside table, right? I have a, separately I have a sort of a separate list of things that will tell me where to look for something. Um, and this, the, that lookup is stored separately from the actual data set. Um, and that's it, a huge majority of your work as an engine programmer will be solved by one of these. This should be your sort of initial default. Um, so that's the third thing that I wanna talk about that I find that many, especially new programmers, new engine programmers are essentially incompetent at is problem solving. Um, so weak problem solving is easily, easily um, the most shocking and biggest issue holding people back. It's not a technical skill. Um, it's not, I don't know SIMD, it's not, I can't read assembly. It's, I can't actually reason about solving a problem full stop. Like, that's the thing that gets in people's way. So, uh, let's talk about, first, what we need to do is decide, what, figure out how we can know we're solving the right problem. 
Um, and solving the right problem is an iterative process. We keep going through these steps over and over again. The steps are understanding the context, understanding the value of solving the problem, understanding the cost of solving the problem, understanding the platform on which you're solving the problem, um, and understanding the data surrounding the problem. We keep looping around these things to approach solving. So let's talk about each one in turn. Um, as we learn information about each of these things, they're always changing. The context is always changing. Whatever we're dealing with, that's always changing. You need to write it down. You need to have a process of literally writing it down because you will forget and you won't, you won't remember what's actually changing. Same thing with value or cost. All of these things are important and changing and you need to write, physically write them down somewhere. Um, talk about context. So what I mean by context, I mean context is all those things that can be assumed to be known. Like when we're, when we're conversing about the problem, we both assume something is true. Um, so that's the context in which we're working with. We're both working, we assume that we're working on a racing game. Like we don't have to talk, keep talking about th that we're working on a racing game. Like we just make that assumption. That's the context in which we're speaking. Um, the more context we have, the better we can solve. Um, we better we can make the problem, the better we can solve the problem. Um, so we need to be working in more context, not in less context. And this, I think, is a trap for most engine programmers specifically, but programmers in general, um, is they try to remove context. They try to make it more generic, more general. Um, what most programmers tend toward is they want to essentially make a compiler, right? They want to create a, lots of little pieces that somebody else can solve the problem. So what I find is I present a problem to an engine programmer. I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you. I present you a problem. I say, here, solve this problem. You say, um, all right, cool, I'm going to solve this problem. Well, how I'm going to solve this problem is I'm going to create a component system where I have a lot of little pieces and I'm going to give that to somebody else so that they can solve the problem. So really what you're doing is some, you're creating a system so that you avoid solving the problem. You're giving it to somebody else to solve. So what's ha actually happening here is you're creating a new problem, right? You create, they, they now have to solve, not only solve the original problem, but they have to solve the problem of all the stuff that you created. Like, what does it mean? How does it work? All that context, right? They have to solve that problem. So you've actually made the problem much bigger by doing that, instead of just solving the problem in the first place. Um, and it's actually harder to solve the problem in that sort of generic space than it is to solve it in, in context. Um, an example that I can give is, let's say you have ladders in your game, right? Um, and you're creating a tool to place objects in your game. There's two choices here. One is a very context-driven choice. Um, so I can imagine a scenario in which, say, I just mouse over the screen and all the places that could legitimately have ladders, right, highlight where a ladder is, and I just click on it, and boom, there's a ladder goes. Because that's because I have the context. I know I'm dropping in ladders. I know what the rules for ladders are. It's very simple. It requires very little in terms of um, sort of cognitive load on the person trying to use it. That's an example. An example with very little context is more generic. I just have a way of placing models in the game. And I separately, I have a way of assigning components and, and, and behavior to things separately. So when, in order to place that ladder, what I need to do is sort of rotate the, you know, load in an object that kind of looks like a ladder, rotate it into place, you know, find it, snap it into the, the, the correct location, double check that it's correct, maybe move it, find out that it's not quite snapped to the next level, whatever, and then I need to go and find some ladder-ish kind of components and attach them to that and do all these things in order to actually create a ladder. That's because I removed all the context that I'm trying to give. Um, the more context that we have, the better we can solve problems. Um, so one thing that should be self-evident is that different problems require different solutions. Um, so if we have, um, uh, you, what you don't want to be doing is trying to fit a solution to a problem, right? You don't have a list of solutions. You don't say, uh, which one of these design patterns works here, right? What you want to say is, what is the actual problem I have? How do I solve it? You're trying to find a solution to a problem, not fit a solution to a problem. And if the problem changes, if something of fundamental about your problem changes, let's like say I go from 100 objects to 10,000 objects in my game, you now have a completely different problem. So the solution is self-evidently different. If, I'm trying to, if you're trying to build, you know, build a game on a 6502 versus you're trying to build a game on you know, um, a modern high-end PC for Oculus. Uh, these are nothing, these problems have very little in common except that they're a game. Um, and so they require very different, vastly different solutions. That should be self-evident, right? Um, and yet, the tendency for programmers is to say, well, 
I can solve this problem generically without sort of considering the hardware, or considering the platform, or considering all, like that's literally not true. That's impossible to do. Um, so in general, as engine programmers, right, um, we want to identify what our, what our users' needs are. Um, so we watch them work, and this can be other programmers. We can watch them work. How do we use these APIs? It can be artists, designers, whatever. Um, we can look at what data they're transforming, right? Everybody, the purpose of any program that anybody's using is to transform data. So, you know, an artist is transforming, maybe transforming those sort of mouse clicks to a model, or maybe using models and transforming this to a groups of other models, or whatever. You know, sort of get a better understanding of what data they're working with. Animators, similarly. Um, and you want to be able to describe what their concrete goals are, this is what I want to do, in as plain a language as possible. This is what I want to accomplish. Um, you don't want to describe it in terms of features as an engine programmer. I'm not trying to build feature X. Um, that does not help anybody. You want to say, what problem am I trying to solve for you? This is their workflow. In language that everybody can understand, this is what's going to happen. Um, so we also, want to ident we also need to identify what the constraints we're working with are. Um, so, in context of building engines and tools, you know, what are our constraints of iteration time? How long can this possibly take in order to be useful? Like, if I give you a tool and I say you're going to build textures, there is a constraint. You maybe not have not articulated, but there is one. You need to figure out what it is. If it took you, you know, two minutes to build this texture, is that acceptable? Like, if all the artists and all the textures, <coughs> it took them two minutes per, is that acceptable? Okay, maybe, maybe not. If it took them two years to build that texture, would that be acceptable, right? Probably not. It's, pro it's self-evident that that would not work. So there is a line, right? There is absolutely a line there. What is it? Identify it, write it down. Then maybe shrink it a little bit to give yourself some room. Um, some other constraints that are useful to consider are learning, right? Sometimes we do things because we want to learn. That's essentially research constraint, right? I want to find something out. I want to explore this space. Well, then the constraint is, uh, have you learned something about that, right? Have you actually researched this area? The point is then, that's a separate problem. A you know, research problem is not a production problem. Those are entirely separate problems and you should be treating them separately. Um, other constraints that you certainly have are size constraints. How big could this possibly be, say in memory or on disk or whatever? There is a limit. There is absolutely a limit. You need to identify what it is. You know, if this model is 50 gigs, it's probably not going to work. Full stuff, like everybody would, everybody would agree it wouldn't work at 50 gigs. You know, where arguments come is how, where the line is, right? How small does it need to be? And so you can't just ignore the problem, right? You can't just say, well, it is as big as it is. You need to actually know what the constraint is in order to design a system um, and does engineer a solution to the problem. Similarly, speed. How long does the system, how long can the system take at runtime, at build time? Um, to iterate on, whatever, whatever the speed constraints are, though you always have those constraints, those constraints exist. How long does it, you know, can you take to do all these navigation queries? There is a limit, you know, is, the late, is it acceptable if the latency is two minutes long to get this navigation query back? Probably not. Okay, so we all agree there is a limit. What is it? Let's write it down, let's figure it out, and then we can engineer for that limit. And similarly, correctness. People assume, I think, uh, incorrectly, that correctness is always the thing that we need to solve for and that we must be perfectly correct. I guarantee every single person in this room, every single thing that you've ever written is not perfectly correct, right? There are flaws in all the things that we do. Um, there are bugs, there are logical errors, there, that's part of the process of writing, right? Um, that's part of the process of writing professionally and trying to ship on time. Sometimes we miss things. Um, so we accept that there's a certain amount of incorrectness that's acceptable in what we do. Um, it's going to happen whether or not you like it. Um, so you have to figure out what the level of acceptability is for your system. How correct can, must it be? Um, how many bugs, how many findable bugs are acceptable? Because honestly, um, there are more bugs than you can possibly find. So you have to, that's the, that is the, you know, the only gauge you have for how many bugs you haven't found yet. Um, so some common traps here. Um, so a lot of programmers like to play the, what I call the what if game, um, which is, uh, you know, well, what if it will do this? Like, I'm trying to build a system and say, well, what if we were, you know, 
I'm trying, let's say we're, you're trying to build a render, and another, another programmer says, well, what if we're trying to make a racing game? Or what if we're trying to make a 2D platform? Or what if, like, okay, stop. Uh, because are we actually trying to do that right now? Like, if that's important, if that, if that decision actually makes an impact on the engineering design of what you're doing, then it's worth stopping and making that decision today. Are we going to make a racing game? Um, and then, well, we don't know if we're going to make a racing game. Okay, what are the odds that we're going to make a racing game? If we can't actually decide that, then we can't actually engineer for the solution at hand. So, are the odds 50-50? Are the odds 80-20? What are the odds that we're actually going to do this thing? Um, and you have to make decisions, engineering decisions, based on those odds, right? You don't have perfect knowledge, but you have to know. What you can never do is just, I'm trying to build the thing that does all the things all the time. Well, this does one, it's not possible, and two, it would be complete garbage. Um, so when you, when you hear people playing the one if game, there's certain questions that you need to ask practically. One, do you have an actual concrete example? Is there an actual case in reality in, under which we would actually do or see this thing, and how common would it be? Can we test for it? Um, can I put a test in to see if this actually happens? Um, how much experience do you have with the problem, or are you just making stuff up? Um, um, understand also concretely that if you solve problems you don't have, you are definitely making new problems. Um, if, I'm creating, if I'm sitting down and I'm trying to make a 2D platformer and we're saying, well, what if we make a racing game? So, okay, I need to expand it to also support racing game engine. I'm creating a whole new set of problems, right? A whole, whole new category of problem space in the racing game category that I don't actually have right now, right? I don't actually have in the game that I'm trying to make. Um, and those have to be tested, those have maintenance costs, those have to be managed, those are bound to impact the current game and reduce the quality and cost and research available for the current game. All that is true. Now, if you are going to make both fine, you engineer for that and you deal with it. But if you're not, you're just creating cost and time and energy and waste that you, that's just not necessary and you solve both problems worse. Uh, future proofing. You will often hear programs say, I want to future proof this. One, it's a complete fool's errand. You cannot future proof. Nothing anybody wrote 50 years ago is still running in games right now. Nothing anybody wrote 20, 20 years ago is still, you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of code written for PS1 that's still running today. Um, uh, things change quickly. And everything that you're doing right now will be almost useless in 20 years. Um, the industry changes, the hardware changes, the approaches that we do changes, everything changes. So accept that whatever you're doing now um, will radically change over the next two decades. Fine, that's just what we do. So know how long a lifespan you expect for the system that you're building is. Is it one year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years? Whatever. Pick it, decide it, and then if you're really serious about it, put a perforce or whatever, you know, check in, it, you know, system in there to just delete it on that day. Right? You, we're saying the lifespan of this is two years long. On two years from today, it's going to go in there and delete this code. So you better have replaced it by then. If you're not super comfortable with that, then you might want to expand that date a little bit, right? And commit to five years or whatever. But that, and it's always going to be longer than you think, right? Oh, we'll replace this in a year. That seems unlikely. It's probably going to be more like five or ten. Um, but know what the upper limit for the lifespan of anything you, you do is. Uh, the future is unknowable. I mean, that's just a general fact. We couldn't predict. We could only predict in generalities of sort of where we would be today. Um, everything is much different. You know, the combination of all the change that happens in the world is much different than we can individually predict. Um, so we just need to accept the future as it comes and make adjustments, um, and not try to uh, not try to not believe that we can create something that's that's going to withstand all the changes of the future. That's simply not possible. Um, another thing that programmers, I think, fail to consider is that you, as an individual programmer, as a human being, um, and as a person who researches and studies and practices, will be much, much better when the future comes, right? In five years, you will be much better at your job. In ten years, you will be much better at your job. Um, so whatever solution you have today, trying to prepare for that future, that future you, in five years, in ten years, will almost certainly think that was garbage. That was a dumb idea. There's no way we should have done that. That was awful. That didn't consider all the facts. I was a horrible programmer back then. Accept that truth, right? You will be better. So just assume, like, solve the problem at hand today. You're doing the very best you can with what you have right now. Solve that problem the best you possibly can and accept that the future you will solve the next problem better. Um, and people are creative, right? If, the, if your goal is to say, I want to create something where, 
where I, I don't want to be too specific because I don't want to box people in, like designers or artists or whatever. I don't want to box them in, and I want to give them lots of options. Look, the reality is the more specific that you give them a solution, right? So this, re this, this engine only does this one thing. It's, it only makes this one type of game. I guarantee you, you put some designers and artists on that, they will make other kinds of games. They will figure out how to make it work. People are uniquely creative, especially in our industry. So just this is not a problem in reality. People will find a way. And in fact, often, it will be better because they could use the constraints of a specific system that you design. Um, Another common trap uh, amongst uh, engine programmers, specifically, um, is trying to oversimplify a problem, uh, or conceptually oversimplify a problem. Um, and the reality is you can't make a problem simpler than it actually is. You can't say, I'm going to abstract this away so I can make the problem simpler. The problem is as complicated as the problem actually is. If there are real variables that really impact the problem. Those don't go away because you wrote a class. Like those, those, those variables are real. Um, you know, the disk of the heart, you know, the, the, the speed of seek on your hard drive impacting how fast you can stream is a real hardware problem that you really need to deal with. You can't abstract it away. Um, the concept, you'll hear programmers talk about, well, abstractions are leaky. Well, no, reality, this is, it's not that abstractions are leaky, it's that this is how reality works. <laughs> Right? This, this thing is dependent on this other fact. I can't simplify that. That is just a complicated problem. Um, another thing you might hear programmers say is, well, you know, all these other programmers sort of hacked up my design or, or how to put all these hacks in it. Um, and they're sort of ruining my API or ruining my system with all these hacks that they put in. Look, if they're hacking in your system, they're putting all these changes in it, the problem is not with the hacks. The problem is with your design. Like they clearly were trying to accomplish something, um, many things potentially, that you simply didn't account for when you built the system. Now, either that's because you ignored the reality that, that they actually had and you were trying to over abstract it or oversimplify it, um, or um, that the problem has just changed over time. You know, one of those things, two things is probably true. But regardless, the problem is not with the hacks. The problem is with the design, and the design is the thing that should be addressed. Um, you need to know where your data is coming from, right? Generally, um, look look at the entire pipeline of data, right? From the source art, from the concept art, from wherever, all the whole pipeline. You need to understand the entire workflow, and then you need to look, examine the data. You know, look at what's coming out of Maya. Look at what's coming out of whatever tools that people are using. Look at the texturing, any tool. Look look at how that built data is working, right? Examine the data. Look at what's happening in runtime. Find a way to dump all the data for various systems that's happening at runtime, examine it, look at it. Um, so spend the time to analyze and examine the data in the entire workflow, all the way back to the source. Um, understand how long something takes to create, right? Um, you can't oversimplify this problem, right? You can't do it in a bubble. Um, Things have dependencies, right? I'm trying to create an object in the game, right? So who needs to be involved in it? This is an animation problem and a modeling problem and a texturing problem and a rendering problem um, and a collision problem and an effects problem and all, you know, all these things have to come in combination. You have to understand how all these things work in order to design any part of that system. Um, you cannot design, say, the animation system in complete isolation from the effects system or in complete isolation from the rendering system. It's not an isolatable problem. It is a complicated problem where all these things do come together. Um, so part of this process is understanding how complex the process is. Um, so there are broken models, right? You create broken models that don't fit, right? Especially if you over try, oversimplify, try to oversimplify the problem, try to over abstract the problem. You've created a broken model, it doesn't fit, people are trying to hack around it, it's constantly broken. Um, it's hard, you have hard problems, you have complicated problems, you have complicated problems with lots of dependency, that's the job. Right? That's what we have to solve. That's an engineering problem. We try, we try to organize that data. We manage that data. We try to figure out what those dependencies actually are, but we don't ignore them. Because um, all we're doing for ignoring it is making it more complicated. Um, the opposite side of this is overcomplicating a problem. Um, and we easily overcomplicate a problem, as I mentioned before, by trying to make it too generic. Um, so I am, in effect, as a programmer, trying to create a new compiler, right? Whether that's through a component system or that's through visual scripting system or that's through an API that I'm creating for other programmers that they just call, right? I'm effectively just creating a poor compiler. 
um, without, without context. And what I need to do is, in fact, have as much context as possible. Um, Another thing that happens commonly amongst programmers, especially coming from an object-oriented program, uh, object-oriented background, is trying to sort of solve their problem through telling a story. Uh, this actor does this and then calls this guy and goes over here and walks over here, and it's essentially a story that they're trying to tell in their code, right? That's not engineering, that's storytelling, and that doesn't solve the actual problem at hand. In fact, it, that, uh, that concept that you're adding to the table, the story that you're putting in the table actually adds another problem that you then need to solve. Because what if the story isn't consistent? Well, then I need to rename things or move things around to make the story consistent. You're trying to solve a story consistency problem for a story that didn't need to exist in the first place. Um, Using generic or making something generic as an excuse, as I mentioned, to not actually solve the problem. I'm just going to make a generic solution and let somebody else solve the problem. Your job as engineers is to actually solve the problem. Um, using generic as an excuse to not talk to users, right? I don't need to, t I don't need to figure out what their problem space is because I'm just going to give them all the tools they need to solve their own problem. That's also not engineering. We need to understand what it is the problem that we're trying to solve. We need to be talking to other programmers, talking to artists, talking to designers. We need to be doing that constantly to understand what it is that we're actually trying to accomplish here. Um, all of this, as I said, sort of de keeps degenerating to another type of compiler. Um, so let's talk, quickly go through the rest of these, which is sort of talking about, after we've talked about context, talking about the value of solving the problem, talking about the cost of solving a problem, the platform, and the data. Um, so we cannot reason about solving a problem unless we understand the value of solving the problem. How much is it worth to solve this problem? Um, so we need to identify with any problem that we're solving what's the specific concrete measurable value. What is it? How much is it worth to solve, it, solve this problem? In real life terms, um, is it worth two weeks of my time to solve this problem? All right. Maybe, maybe not. Is it worth two years of my time to solve this problem? Is it worth 10 years of my time to solve this problem? I think in most problem spaces you would agree it's not worth two, 10 years of my time to solve this particular problem, um, whatever that problem may be. So then you agree that there is a limit. <laughs> Let's back it out and figure out what that limit is. Because if you're spending more than that amount of time trying to solve the problem, you are negative ROI, right? You're losing money <laughs> trying to solve a problem that's not worth solving. You need to stop. You need to say, I have two weeks, I have six weeks, that's how much it's worth. If it takes any longer than that, I need to not solve the problem. I need to stop. Um, and if you know you have six weeks, that's how much it's worth. It's worth spending six weeks on this problem. You can engineer for that. I'm going to find a solution that I can actually put in here that will take less than this amount of time. Because if I take more, it's not worth doing. Um, this is not about being a suit, right? This is not about being um, you know, an executive or worrying about you know, being an accountant. This is about being precious with your, the, the resource that's most important to you, which is your time. That's what you have to organize. That's how you be, you, you be professional at your job. You take the things that are important and you value them um, and you organize them and you manage them. And your time is valuable and you have to manage it. In order to do that, you have to know how val the value of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so part of this is sort of breaking down the business case for any particular system. Like, I want to put this in. What's the case for it, right? You know, is it you know is it um, a cost of entry thing? This is what the players expect. Is it reducing development time? Is it because we want to learn? Is it something that we want to enable in terms of exploration? Is it to improve size, improve, reduce size, improve speed? Whatever. I know why I'm doing this. Um, and selling your feature to the rest of the team is a big part of the job, right? Being able to pitch your idea and say, it's worth this. It's worth us spending this time on. It's worth us spending six months on, three months, two months, whatever. Pitching that to your lead, pitching that to the rest of the team, production, getting everybody on board with what you're doing is a huge part of the job. That's a massive part of being a professional programmer, is being able to explain the value of what you're doing. Um, so you need to be able to articulate those targets specifically. How much iteration time are you saving? How much speed? Um, how much is one man, one man month of production time worth in terms of your value? Like, what are you trading off? Um, what's the cost of solving this problem? Um, so you look at your predicted development time. I, I, think, I think I can solve this problem in two weeks. All right, starting here, you're wrong. Um, I mean, everybody wants to be much better at predicting how long it's going to take them to solve a problem. Um, you can, do, you can in incrementally improve your ability to predict, but at the end of the day, the only things that you can predict with significant accuracy are the things you've already done. 
to be doing something new, it's very difficult to predict exactly how long it's going to take. However, if you work from the backward, if you work from the other way and say, I have six weeks, it's worth spending six weeks, you can now start to engineer a solution that can be fit into that time. <coughs> so we start with, okay, I have six weeks, what can I do in one week? Because I need something in the bag. I need to make sure that if I, you know, if, if I get to six weeks and I don't have anything else, I at least have this one thing. So you start with plan B immediately. What can I do in a six of the time so I have at least something in case everything else fails. So as a programmer, I think about you're going to spend six months on developing the system, right? Or three months or two months or whatever. Um, when you get to the goal date, the game has to ship. No, there's no question about whether or not this game is shipping. Your system is broken or not. This game is going out the door. Um, your system is broken right before goal date. What are you going to do on that day, right? You're not going to say, well, I, ha I have three more weeks to, sip to, you know, to make this work. No, you're going to hack the crap out of this to just sort of make it work in the time that you have. Okay, whatever that thing you would do at the last possible minute, do that first so that you have that in the bag, and then you can work on what you think is a better solution, right, um, based on the time available. And you also need to be constantly considering what the opportunity cost is, right? Anything that you're working on, um, any time you're spending on something, something specific will mean that if that's time you cannot spend on something else. Um, so you need to be constantly vigilant about where your time is going. Um, maintenance cost, however, is the real cost over time on anything that we're working on. We will spend the vast majority of our time maintaining systems that we have made or somebody else has made. So that's the thing that you need to build into your estimates at the beginning. How much will it cost to maintain? How can I minimize the cost of maintaining that? How can I get myself out completely out of the loop in terms of maintaining this? How can I build reports or something so that people can solve their own problems quickly and not have to you know, bring me in? How many bugs are likely to occur in the system? Um, that's based, you, can, you can have estimates based on how connected is this to other systems. The more connected it is to other systems, the more likely it's to have bugs, the more likely it's to crash. Right? There are estimates that you can use to determine how much the maintenance cost is likely to be. Um, you can look at statistics in terms of your maintenance costs on systems they've already developed over time, over the last few years. How does that, you know, how can you use that to predict what the maintenance cost for the system will be? Um, that's part of the real cost of developing a system. So if you can't reason about the maintenance cost, you can't, you can't even have, you don't have no idea how much maintenance this is going to take. Um, um, you're spending resources, you're spending your time that you don't actually have, right? Um, you're just saying this will take two weeks and that's the whole cost. You're committing, but in reality you're committing to this whole bunch of time, this whole bunch of resources in terms of real life maintenance that costs real money and real time and it takes away from other projects um, that you haven't accounted for, that, that then at that point wasn't budgeted. Um, so sources of maintenance costs. How do you determine what's, you know, what are the things that are going to cost you maintenance? Um, you know, the data is changing. I didn't, I didn't realize the data changed. I didn't realize we went from 10 to a 10,000 objects. I didn't have any system in there to track that. Um, the requirements changed. Um, so, you know, some, something has to change. I didn't have any system for tracking that, that the requirements are how people use this actually changed. Um, I have constraints changed. I had no way of communicating, you know, the limits of this. Um, and somebody kept bumping them until it broke. Um, there's untested parts of this, the, tra the transform is super complicated, all this bunch of things came together and they found a new and unique way to break the system, right? That happens all the time. Um, unexpected use cases, dependency changes, so I'm relying on some other system and the other system changed. Um, bad inputs, some, you know, somebody built something that I didn't expect. Just usage training, right? I built a system that's complicated and I have to train people and we have new people that come in and I have to spend time teaching them how to use it. Um, the infrastructure itself changes, right? We're built on top of, um, you know, we're built on top of Chrome and Chrome sends an update and that changed. Or we're built on top of Windows and Windows sends an update and that changed. Or DirectX or whatever, the infrastructure that we're built on top of changes. Or any other changes whatsoever. If I make any change to the system, the likelihood that, uh, that another bug will appear based on this change is extremely high. The best way you can stop the in bugs incoming to your system is to stop working on the system. Uh, so what inevitably comes up as part of a conversation in terms of um, engine design um, is the build versus buy question, right? Should I build it or should I buy it? Um, and the only way that you can answer this question is how much, how, 
is how well you can reason about the question of value versus cost, right? How much is this worth and how much is this going to cost us to build? What's the context in which we're building it? What are we trying to build it for? If you can't actually reason about these things, you can't actually answer these questions um, of whether or not we should build it, or whether or not we should buy it. And so what you'll hear is, well, my feeling is that, right? Anytime somebody says, my fe I feel that, um, you need to stop and say, how about we stop with the feelings and we start with the reason? Um, let's reason through this, right? We are engineers, we can apply reason, we can apply a process, we can write this down. Um, and that's what we need to do, right, as professionals. We need to problem solve with a process. Um, the platform, in fact, um, affects everything we do. You cannot abstract away the platform that you're working on. Um, reality is not a hack you need to deal with to solve your abstract theoretical problem. Reality is the actual problem, right? The hardware that you're dealing with, the, the, the console, the mobile device, the network, all the things that you're actually dealing with, the OS, whatever, those are the actual problem. That's the thing you actually need to solve for. There's no theoretical problem. That is the problem that you need to solve. Um, the real life users that you have, the real life artists and designers, the players, those are all, that's part of the real problem. That's the reality of things that you need to solve for. Um, so, you know, one, there's no such thing as platform independent. You literally cannot make something platform independent. Um, you, can, you can remove commonalities, right? There are things that are common between these two platforms. That's fine. Um, but one thing you can do is read the manual. Uh, you, ha you are likely to be working on a finite set of platforms. Um, read them. They have manuals. Read them. Um, you know, you, for instance, X64, ARM, those are, like, that covers probably 90% of the people in this room. Um, you get those two, there's two manuals there that you can read, or two sets of manuals that you can read, and get a big, a significant background. Um, um, but you know, in terms of GPUs, similarly, NVIDIA versus ATI versus PowerVR, right? That covers a wide range of the things that are likely to be dealing with in this room. OpenGL versus OpenGLS versus DirectX versus Vulkan, whatever. Understand what those specific platforms require and how they work. Windows versus Linux. Um, simply can't abstract these things away. Um, Shared device, as I mentioned, share, any shared device has is so, something that you can't abstract away, right? You can't abstract away that memory is shared, or that the disk is shared, or that the network is shared. All the systems are fighting for this resource. This is a re reality that you must deal with. Um, so that's caches, and RAM, and hard drive, and optical disk, and network, and all the things. Um, you are responsible for knowing your tools, right? As we mentioned, that's a compiler is an example. You have to know how it works. You have to know what it does. Um, how exactly what does it output? Why does it output that? It's your tool. It's the thing that you use to generate the thing. You are responsible for understanding how the tool works. Um, you are responsible for knowing how you can influence the output of the tool. Um, you are ultimately responsible for the output of the tool. That's the thing that you're responsible for. Anything that gets any tool that you have that gets in the way of you understanding how it works is a bad tool. Um, so anytime the, a compiler developer or a tool developer is going to say, well, we can't, we, can't help, we can't explain that to you, how that's going to work, or it's just random, you know, we seek it to our secret sauce. At that point, you, you're, you have a problem, uh, right? It's, if you can't predict how it works, it gets in your way, and it's actually a bad tool, or it's a bad sign in, in, in terms of that tooling. And finally, understand your data. Everything is a data problem. Every problem, everything that we deal with, everything is a data problem. It, Every program and every part of every program is designed to transform data from one form to another. That's all they ever do. Um, so if you don't understand the data that you're dealing with, you do not understand the problem. If you don't know the limits of this, if you don't know how many objects you have, if you don't know what range they have, if you don't know how likely they're, they're, they're to, how likely they're going to appear statistically, when they're going to appear statistically over time, how they're going to be grouped statistically. If you don't know any of this information, you don't understand the problem. Therefore, any solution that you, you create is going to be wrong. Um, as I mentioned, so how do you gather data? You know, I, I don't have all this data to start with, so I build systems to, to gather data so that I can iterate on the problem. So I learn more about the systems that I'm working with so I can create a better system. Um, I sample the input and output data, right? At runtime, I have a function. I just save out all the inputs to this function, all the outputs to this function, and I can analyze it offline and see what I'm actually getting over time and then make adjustments to what that does. I need to visualize it in as many ways as I can, whether that's creating a 3D graph, it's just putting it into Excel, whether that's just transforming it in different ways and, you know, with a script and a text file, whatever, I spend time transforming that data. That's how you reason about a problem. Um, 
You have to know what is read and written over time, what those access patterns look like statistically, um, what data, data is accessed statistically relative to other data. If I access this, I'm very likely to access this next, right? Understanding those patterns statistically is important. Um, what values are more, most common? You know, I see this, this kind of scale, like, all right, I see a uniform scale in my objects 99% of the, the time. That's a fact that you should know and that you can design around. The outlier is something that's non-uniform scale, let's say. Um, what ranges are common? What are the outliers for that? What data causes branches, right? How, what are your, if you look through your, your state machine, right, your code or whatever, you have various branches in there. What is the data change that causes that branch to happen that makes a different choice? How likely is it statistically? Um, so you have tools that are, live inside of your game, live inside of your other tools. You have tools that live outside. You gather data, you write scripts outside of those. You have to have both of these things, right? You deal with it. You have to have, you have ephemeral tools that you've built, purpose built just to look at this data. That, that's all the only purpose that they serve. Um, the reality that we're dealing with though today is that common tools for this kind of analysis simply don't exist. Right? There's no good tools for this off the shelf. Like, they just don't exist. We spend so much time as an industry building tools to how we can refactor our code or, look, or step through our code or step through the text or move the text or collapse the text. There's so much, so much time and energy as, a, as an industry collapsing text. Um, but almost no time solving the actual problem that we need to deal with, which is analyzing our data throughout the whole process. So you're inevitably going to have to create your own sort of ad hoc, ad hoc tools for this analysis. But that's fine, that's what you do. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we want to get all the clowns out of the car, right? So look for, basically, look for any unnecessary work. So this is work that just does, simply has no reason to be done, and don't do that. That is not premature optimization, that is just getting, stop doing the stupid things, right? If it's dumb and it has no reason, stop doing it. So only solve the problem and do nothing other than solve the problem at hand. Um, so, what, what is it that I expect engine programmers to know, right? Um, in order to solve the right problem, I expect them to understand what the context of the problem is, what the value of the problem is, solving the problem is, what the cost of solving the problem is, what, what the platform is and how that impacts solving the problem, and what the data they have is. Um, I expect them, in short, to understand how to solve a problem. I also expect them to have reasonable defaults for how they approach problems. Um, and I expect them to know how to practice well. Um, and I hope that over time this will take, say, that two-year time frame and shrink to a, more closer to a six-month time frame. That's my hope. Um, and that's where I'll leave you. So, any questions? I take that in no questions. <laughs> okay, that's it.